Thanks very much for the very kind introduction, Chris. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. Um, it's, it's really amazing to see so many people come out to hear about a region that so few uh, have, uh, know very much about or have ever even visited. And so I'm hoping that by the end of the evening, we will all, you will all be able to count yourselves amongst the few that know something about the Black Desert of Eastern Jordan. I wanted to offer just a little bit of a road map uh, of where this lecture will go. And I want to offer a very brief overview of how the project initially started and about the region in general, of course. And then secondly, I wanted to look, just give you a few examples, very summarized examples of some of our excavations to date, which have really been quite limited. And I'll show you some of the reasons why they've been so limited. Third, I'll introduce you to the problem of attempting to accurately survey and map areas that are far richer than we realized or than anybody had realized. And finally, I'll offer just a few interpretations and discuss our future goals for this research project. The Eastern Body Archaeological Project study comprises a, sort of a, a, a west-east transect across the southern part of the eastern Badia. And you've already heard Chris use that term, Badia. It simply means desert. This is the, the Black Desert in the panhandle of Jordan, that long part that reaches out towards Iraq, north of Arabia, north of Saudi Arabia. We selected this area to, to try to include some different sort of minor ecological zones and to provide opportunities to assess the evidence for links with the Levantine Corridor, obviously to the west, the Haran to the north, northern Arabia and Mesopotamia. The two areas we selected will com uh, allow comparisons based on these excavations, survey, and subsistence. Our broader goal is to record and study the architecture, the artifacts, and petroglyphs, integrating that data with biological and paleoclimactic data in order to understand human occupation and use of the region. We're particularly interested in preliminary evidence that, suggesting that there was a fluorescence of human activity in the Black Desert that was possible during the later prehistory because of environmental conditions possibly much more uh, favorable than, uh, than in the present modern situation. Well, one of the reasons there hasn't been a whole lot of work in this part of the uh, Jordanian panhandle is that it is such a difficult marginal area. It's rarely discussed, and as all of you know, uh, many of the projects that are often discussed are in the Fertile Crescent. And of course, this is the marginal area, uh, not the marginal area outside of the Fertile Crescent. You can see that large black area. This is the Black Desert. It's called so because of the the uh, basalt flows, the lava flows that extend from southern Syria right across the mid part of the panhandle of Jordan and down into, into southern Saudi Arabia. This means that it's a very rough territory and very difficult to traverse. Nonetheless, people of course will try, and here are some of the early efforts in the early 20th century to get across this area. Uh, there, even now, there is one asphalt road that goes from uh, say Amman to Baghdad, and the rest of it is flat and basaltic area. So overland transport in the early parts of say the British Empire were very difficult, and these were just some of the solutions. And of course you see Henry Field with his Cadillac and presumably his lunch or dinner strapped across the front of the car. There's an area that was, um, one of the problems for the British was to move from, uh, more quickly than that, to move from Baghdad to Cairo and get the mail going from one place to the other. Overland transport was so difficult and so slow. So the solution, of course, was to fly. And there's this wonderful book by uh, Air Chief Marshal Sir Roderick Hill, who wrote a book about the travels of the Royal Air Force flying the Cairo to Baghdad mail route. And this is one of the maps from his book, The Baghdad Air Mail, published in 1929. He refers to various places, and in the title of my lecture, of course, I've referred to the land of conjecture. And that's what's really going to be our major focus this evening, is what he called the land of conjecture, that basaltic area. But I can't resist also pointing out a few of the other uh, names that he gave to places that he could see below him. I was just checking back on some of his uh, writing just recently, and he, he did mention that, in fact, he 
knew probably the Bedouin didn't have the same names as what he was giving for the landscape that he could see that he was flying over. So land of conjecture, probably not the local term down below, and probably also not the plane of unfulfilled desire, which I highlighted <laughs> there, and also probably not the plane of sorrows, which probably reflects more on the loneliness of being a, a lonely uh, RAF pilot going across the, the desert. Um, I also mention this because um, he, did, he did say that some of these places such as, you won't be able to read it, uh, most people except for maybe in the first row where you can see things like Fickles Furlong and uh, a few other names like that where there have been some aviation problems or accidents out in the desert. He also, and these are quotes from Sir Roderick Hill in his book, uh, found the place quite odious. That place was the epitome of loneliness. All around the hills rose like odious flat top slag heaps, very desolate, and filled me with a sinister foreboding. <laughs> there was another pilot who was also one of those flying across this region, making the same route, and that was Percy Maitland. And Maitland flew over this particular mesa that you see in the picture on the left, uh, and this is, came to be known as Maitland's Hill Fort. Now, Percy Maitland thought that this looked very much like an Iron Age fortress that he had flown over in Wales. And you can see, you can just make out in his picture that was published in the first year of the journal Antiquity, still a, an ongoing journal of international fame. You can see around the edges of the mesa how, it, how you could get the impression that it looks like walls or some sort of fortifications. Um, but as we'll see, that's actually natural, uh, much of it at least. Obviously, these pilots got a perspective that uh, we can't really see from the ground now. And so they started recognizing things like these structures that you can see all over the top of Maitland's Fort. So this area that we're going to look at first is the Wadi al Katafi mesas. And here you see we've numbered the mesas. There's another series of mesas to the south of this. But the ones that we'll look at this evening where we're focusing our research are the Wadi al Katafi mesas. And this one is a more modern picture of uh, Maitland's Mesa, taken by David Kennedy, who flies all over Jordan, takes aerial photographs, makes them publicly available. It's really a remarkable service, and we're very lucky to be able to use these kinds of photos. He's taken pictures of Maitland's Mesa, and you, see, you can see that we've numbered all of the different structures on top of Maitland's Mesa, and along the edge, you can see this whole series of structures. Now, already I've mentioned that not a lot of research has been done out in the area, but I, would, uh, I, I wouldn't want to give you the impression that nobody had done anything. And in fact, there, there has been a little bit of work done in the region, and one of the pioneers of doing, uh, identifying some small prehistoric sites, particularly working in the 80s and 90s, is Allison Betts, who you see on the left. Uh, Professor Betts visited us in Wasad Pools for, a, I think, more for old times' sake than anything, but she worked with us and uh, seemed to quite enjoy the rather rough circumstances. And so, although very few people had done some work, we did know that before 7,000 years ago, there were some small bands of hunters making real, pre pretty insubstantial structures out in the desert, and that was largely due to Allison Betts. Now, another one of the pioneers of archaeology in Jordan is Professor Gary Rolison, you see on the right. And uh, this is who suggested that we start a project when we visited Maitland's Mesa together when I was uh, in Jordan as Fulbright Scholar in 2006, 2007. Uh, so there, there, it's not that there's not been very much, that there's been no research done out there, but it's been very, very slender. Uh, and Gary is actually much better known for the famous site of Ein Ghazal, so he's, he's actually only started working in the desert about 10 years ago as well. And in this picture, you might be wondering what he's doing. He is working on making some uh, desert coolers, as he calls them, by wrapping uh, wet bandanas around your beverages so that they'll be cooler, cooler than the ambient temperature of 105 or something like that. Um, it's very refreshing. Uh, not everybody's convinced this is very, very, uh, uh, very pleasant. Uh, so this is Maitland's Mesa. You can see how the mesas are capped with a thick layer of basalt. So these, these are parts of those lava flows. Below that is limestone. And so this is how they've eroded. And you can see how the basalt is crumbling, eroding off of the edge uh, and going down the slopes. That material, of course, is being used as building material, as we'll see. One of the things when we visited, when I visited with Gary Rolofson and my co-director, Alex Wass, was that there were structures like these you see um, that were pretty substantial stone blocks, large circular structures ranging anywhere from three to eight meters in, in uh, diameter. And we thought that perhaps these looked a bit like what are known as Nuwamis. The Nuwamis are 
uh, dry masonry burial structures that are known in Sinai, and similar types of structures are also known in other places of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, but best known from Sinai in several different, uh, in at least three major concentrations, which you are still standing, as far as I know, at least in, as of the 80s and 90s. So we thought that this might be what we were looking at at Maitland's Mesa. Now, Maitland's is different than some of the other mesas because it has uh, a whole collection of these structures on top. Most of the other mesas have at least one, mesa, uh, one tower tomb on top of it, but not so many structures like this. So what you're looking at is a tower tomb that's been looted, and all of the tower tombs on each different mesa have been looted, some of them probably some time ago. And then a series of chambers, uh, cairns, along the edge of the mesa. And this is just an image of the tower tomb. You can see how it must have stood fair amount higher. You can see that it's still standing at least several meters, and all of that stone that's been thrown out by looters or has collapsed from earthquakes uh, meant that it must have been four or five meters high, at least, originally. Those cairns that are along the edge of Maitlands are also a little bit perplexing. We, we know them from other sites in Yemen and Saudi Arabia, similar structures, and we don't really know even what to date them to. They seem to be connected to that tower tomb, and you can see how a lot of them are sort of collapsed. People have pulled rocks out, of course, because there's going to be gold inside, right? Um, as far as we can tell, there's nothing inside. And uh, there, you see a drawing there of some of those that are still uh, in pretty good shape. There are other structures on top of Maitland's Mesa. Some look pretty ephemeral, don't look like they have a great deal of depth. Others seem to be maybe standing stones or walls of vertical slabs. And even some things that we called gura, gura huts. Gura are what the local Bedouin call those flat-topped mesas. And we, you can see what a, the, the picture on the top is what a, a, uh, these single-celled structures look like. And then below, you can see where we've ex excavated a double-celled one on top of a mesa. Unfortunately, we found almost nothing inside of those structures. I mean, no flint tools, no radiocarbon, nothing carbonized. So really difficult to know what they were doing there or uh, even how to date them. Just generally speaking, on top of the mesa, uh, we do find some artifacts. So those artifacts only loosely date things. So there's some stone tools that we know from other sites that date ranging anywhere from the late Neolithic to the early Bronze Age. That's a range of about 3,000 years. So late prehistory perhaps dates some of these structures on top, but beyond that, we're really not certain. On the slopes down below of Maitlands, there are other structures that we started to notice. It actually took us a while to recognize these structures on the lower slopes, because we had been focused on the aerial photographs and looking at the top. And there are at least 80 different collapsed mounds. And this takes us back to what we thought these might be the Nuwamis on these lower slopes. We thought we had possibly a cemetery. Why there would be a cemetery out in the desert, uh, we weren't really certain, but it seemed interesting. And for instance, this structure, you can see there's sort of a radial pattern to the collapsed basalt slabs. And we thought that this might be a Nuwami. And th this this one we selected for obvious reasons. It didn't look like it was looted. It was obviously collapsed. It even still had a standing doorway. So this seemed a little bit similar to a burial chamber. In excavating it, we quickly found out that we were wrong. Um, and in fact, it turns out to be a well-made structure. And it even seems to be corbelled. And by corbelled, I mean that the, 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 the stones are cantilevered to be able to make a roof heading inwards to the top. And there would have been a central pillar that's, that was there, but no longer standing. We'll see some examples of still standing ones. You can see the flagstone of the later interior. And the Ds on the right side of the drawing mark where there were two doorways. Remarkably, there was even an outside storage room that still had a standing pillar, still had a roof being held up by that, that little pillar. And this was just on the outside attached to that building. So not only did we know that we did not have a burial structure or a Nawamis, but in fact, it seemed that we had a late Neolithic structure of a type that was really not familiar. Now, to be honest, um, as Chris said, I have a little more expertise in other things in uh, slightly uh, earlier, uh, later periods. And uh, so something late Neolithic like this, I'm not an expert on it. I'm, I feel like I'm getting there now, but this was relatively new to me, uh, but my colleagues are, are well versed in the Neolithic, and a structure like this is not very typical. You can see the two doorways. We were lucky enough to find one, uh, one piece of charcoal that we could date, 
as any archaeologist can tell you, one, one radiocarbon date is not the world, but it's better than nothing. It made us very happy. And that radiocarbon date is 5480 to 5320 calibrated BC. So in the late Neolithic, towards the end of the late Neolithic. And that's even supported. We didn't get that many finds from that structure, but the arrowheads that we found in the structure are also late Neolithic, and that also works very well with us having a late Neolithic house on the slopes of Maitland's Mesa. As you see here, you can see the doorway and the storage to the side. Now, that's, that was surprising, and we still weren't really convinced. Uh, we just thought this was maybe a one-off when we got a late Neolithic house. Um, it also doesn't help us answer some of the major questions still to deal with at Maitland's. So there are neat, late Neolithic houses on the lower slopes. What are all these structures on top? I'll just point out to you that it looks like the top of that mesa has got a bit of a bowl shape, a bit of a dip, and you can see where sediments are collecting. And it appears, and it's nothing right now more than a guess, that it looks like water was collecting up there because we had thought that there were maybe animal pins on the top, but who would do that to sort of force all of your flocks up on top of the mesa, unless it's defensive. But if there was water catching up there, maybe. But we're what we're thinking now is that it's possible that they were actually planting things up on top of the mesa because water was caught there in the winter. It's just a, just a hypothesis now, and it's something that we'll be working on. We did actually drag the uh, Oriental Institute members uh, society who went on the Jordanian trip this past year out to visit the structure, which is a little worse for the wear because looters are always convinced that we miss the gold and they will find it and then start tearing buildings apart, unfortunately. So there you can see the intrepid travelers made it all the way out to Maitland's Mesa, which is a two hour drive over very rough roads from Azraq, in case you know where Azraq is, more like four or five hours from Amman. And those, so there we have our group. Uh, just below Maitland's Mesa. Well, after excavating that structure, we then went to the other site of Wasad Pools. We excavated another structure that we thought would be a burial chamber, and that also was not a burial chamber. In later returning to another mesa in the Wadi Katafi area, we started, our eyes were getting better, and we started to realize that, in fact, there are a whole series of these collapsed structures at another mesa just one kilometer up the Wadi. You can see all of these different um, all the little collapsed piles all around, something on the order of hundreds, and some sort of wheel, a radial wheel with interior straight walls. And then we decided to excavate this structure over here. You can already see where we've started the excavations. So uh, at this point, we thought that we might be excavating something similar. And sure enough, another structure. It's actually not as similar to the other one as you might think. Yes, they're both round, and yes, they're both a few meters across. So generally similar. Uh, but this one, you can actually see that the central uh, pillar is still standing. And in fact, there are other pillars still standing in, built into the wall. Here you see a hearth and a very narrow entrance, and even one that's probably collapsed. So this doesn't seem to be a corbelled structure. Nonetheless, it is a late Neolithic structure near to the other one. It had a lot more arrowheads, so that helps understand uh, that it was a hunting uh, uh, some sort of base for hunting. And you can see the radiocarbon dates that I've put there in blue in the lower part. You'll notice, if you could still remember the radiocarbon date of the last structure, that they're not that close. They're almost a thousand years apart. So this is sort of both ends, bracketing both ends of what's known as the late Neolithic. It had a very nicely built interior hearth. And surprisingly, it also had uh, plaster. In fact, a double layer of plaster. You can see the original layer of the plaster up here, and then it was replastered, and you can still see the fingerprints of where they pressed this gypsum plaster right into the floor of the interior. We had more arrowheads. The arrowheads on the right are quite large, clearly uh, for a larger game. And then we even had a piece of obsidian. The obsidian is not an arrowhead, but the obsidian is almost certainly going to be traced back to Anatolia. We've been working with uh, Tristan Carter's and his uh, XRF lab at McMaster University in Canada, and any of the obsidian we've sent him so far has come from Anatolia, so we're quite sure that this one will as well. So that was a, a very quick and brief introduction to what's going on in Wadi al Katafi. Now we're going to move on over to Wasad Pools. Now, Wadi Katafi is probably about 60 kilometers from the town of Azraq, and uh, so that's about four hours, five hours driving from Amman. And Wasad Pools is about another 60 kilometers to the east of Wadi al Katafi, which means about two more hours driving through the desert. Think of it, only 60 kilometers takes about two hours. It's quite slow going. 
Now with sod pools, it looks quite different. No mesas and uh, very difficult to see much uh, in the landscape. Uh, but in fact, there are a series of pools. Uh, natural pools, but pools that had been uh, had little check dams, so they've sort of enhanced the pools. So you can see there's about nine pools over the course of about one kilometer. It, this, this is declination of only about 10 meters, so it's not a great deal of um, change between where the first pool is uh, over here and uh, where it uh, empties out into the playa, into the mud pan. Now around these pools are a whole series of structures. We'll see some other pictures of them, but you can already start to make out many of these uh, collapsed piles, as well as other things that look like animal corrals. This is where we camp. This is our, this is our accommodations for the four weeks out there. You, can, you might have difficulty making out the muddy water that's still there, because when we arrive, sometimes it's rained. And if it's rained in the immediate area, the pools do actually have water in them. Although not for very long, because in fact, the Bedouin come up with big trucks big water trucks and suck the water out and take it away to their flocks. So this is our camping spot. Uh, I think somebody's probably cleared a little spot there uh, with a, some sort of heavy machinery or something. I should point out that in the early days of our work, uh, we were pretty desperate and that's how we uh, sort of kept ourselves out of the sun originally. We would just get a nice tarp and stretch it out against the rocks and put it in the door of the truck and huddle down there sort of like scared uh, and very hot mice for uh, the entire afternoon. It was pretty rough going. Uh, now we're feeling much wealthier and we actually have some tents that we can hide under in the afternoon and uh, we're immensely more comfortable as you can see. We're just uh, swatting flies and happily in our, in our recycled uh, coffee bean uh, shade and that's basically what you do for the entire afternoon. And I should add here that if this is something that looks appealing to you and you, <laughs> you hate the internet and you're tired of taking showers, you really should consider joining us uh, because we have neither. So Wasad Pools has got a whole cluster of structures as well. And uh, they're, they're, they're really concentrated close to the structures. We've numbered about 125 of them. And uh, we know from walking around the whole area and taking GPS points on a lot of them that there's many more hundred that we have not mapped. I'll just point out a few features here. Of course, here you see the pools down here cutting in quite deeply there. You can see what is a kite like a hunting trap, an animal trap. We'll talk about that in a moment. And you can even see some long cairns like we saw on the edge of Maitland's Mesa. So you can see why we would have thought that maybe this was a cemetery. We had only excavated that one structure at Maitland's Mesa when we came to this site. So with great optimism and interest, we uh, selected another structure and began clearing. Now you'll notice that this is uh, quite a large pile of rocks. They're basalt rocks, they're extremely heavy. And uh, it takes a while to clear them. So in fact, this structure, uh, structure number 88 with sod pools, took us two seasons to excavate, and it's actually still not really quite complete. We started clearing the rocks, and of course we started clearing the rocks with uh, wonderful undergraduates who make rocks literally just float away. And we, we quickly realized that there was something odd about this. There was a wall on top that was kind of shabby. Yes, it's lined up, and they're big rocks, but it doesn't really look much like some of the other things we found. It was only after the second season of excavation, we sort of suspected there was something odd about the, this, this sort of wall that you see. Uh, and by the second season, we realized that in fact, some enterprising person in, at the very end of the late bronze or early iron age had decided that this Neolithic structure below it would make a great place to put their tomb and built it on top of the Neolithic house. And uh, so, unfortunately, the human remains were, were like powder from, from whatever reason. They were not very deeply buried, of course. They were really just in the rocks, probably. Uh, but the artifacts were not badly preserved, and so you can see a bronze ring in the upper left-hand corner, a, um, a silver, silver earring just below that, and over on the right, a bronze arrowhead. So these can be dated to other sites further uh, west in Palestine and Israel to the very end of the late Bronze II or early Iron Age, so somewhere around 1200 BC. Very slow going, and this is the reason it's so slow going. We are a very small group of people, eight to 10 people, and these slabs are incredibly large, heavy, and if you think about it, dangerous, because you certainly don't want to have one, a finger or a toe underneath that, so we try to be extremely careful because we're very far from any serious help. 
Um, so this, and you know, not only is it difficult, some of them are too large to even pick up, but we have to sort of flip them one by one. And in doing that, we're trying to also not destroy ourselves, but also not destroy the archeology span that we've so carefully excavated. Many hundreds of pounds of dead rock will do a lot of damage if, if dropped on the archeology. span So you can see some enterprising, and I'll note enterprising women with just uh, one, one guy from the, um, uh, from the royal family in Jordan helping out. Uh, this, it, it's a lot of very hard work moving all those rocks. But eventually we did it. And you can see below um, a structure that looks, well, round like the others that we've seen, but in some ways quite different. It does seem more complex. It has different rooms, has different areas. It has features built inside of it. Um, I'll give you a few clues as to some of the enigmatic uh, letters that you see. You have to call these things something while you're in the field. So P stands for porch or portico because we had to know what the person's referring to. And A refers to an alcove. And um, G is just an area of grinding slabs. And D is a doorway. So this is quite a complex structure. It's probably been reconstructed quite a bit. I'll draw your attention to the lower right-hand corner where you see the rope, the, uh, the radiocarbon dates. Uh, there's actually five radiocarbon dates now from this structure, but they span the course of pretty much the entire late Neolithic, so from about 6500 to 5600 BC. That's not to say that people lived in this building the entire time for a thousand years. They probably reoccupied it, rebuilt it, changed things around, but it was intensively used, and there's a lot of artifacts and a lot of animal bone inside of it in the excavations. Surprisingly, for people who seem to be mainly hunters, there are also a lot of very large grinding slabs. And you can see just a few uh, very near that central pillar right along here. And I'll point out, of course, that there is a central pillar here, another one here, another one here. Again, note how low these pillars are. It's probably difficult for you to see, but they're just a little over a meter high. We don't really understand what the roof looked like on these, because a meter is only enough to crawl around on your hands and knees. And that seems pretty impractical to me. Uh, so we haven't really figured out how this worked or what the roof looked like, or did it really have a roof? It must have had some kind of roof. Um, I've wondered if perhaps these pillars held up poles for skins that kept them up a little bit higher. Uh, my colleagues don't buy that, so I guess I'll just put that out as a hypothesis. These large grinding slabs do suggest that there was some sort of processing going on and that we would guess perhaps plant processing. You can see how there's sort of a mortar divot in these large slabs, and there's quite a number of them. So this would suggest a fair amount of processing is going on. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep putting new ones in the structure and adding more of them. And just over in the corner, where we see this doorway that has probably been refashioned, this probably used to be the whole doorway, and then they closed it off, narrowed it down, and right where you see that little red and white spike, we found a little uh, cache in the doorway, just in the nook, just in the inside of that doorway, as, as if it was just a little offering of uh, astragali, gazelle astragali. Uh, quite a surprise. Now, you, you, uh, those of you with sharper eyes will notice that these are not all entirely in situ because somebody didn't realize what they were excavating right away. But this is, in fact, the, the context where they were found. We still do some things uh, old school, and uh, drawing everything inside of the structure with planning frames is the way to go. Um, so you can see people working on drawing everything. One of our concerns, though, is to understand if there are plants, what are people doing out here? Why are they building such big structures? This is not something that people who are constantly moving on the landscape you would expect to be doing. You would expect them to uh, make flimsier kinds of structures that we know of from earlier periods. This is really a lot of substantial building, a lot of uh, animal bones, a lot of materials all in one place. So our guess, is, and we're, we're starting to get some evidence to support this guess, that there were, in fact, better conditions, better environmental conditions, and possibly even some soil when these people were there. And some of the evidence for that is where um, Matt, Matt Jones, a geo, uh, geomorphologist from the University of Nottingham, is checking and taking OSL samples and core samples from under the building where we're finding these gritty, permeable soils that might have been protected because the buildings were built on top of that. He's also taken core samples from out in the, in the Ka, the playa, and the core samples uh, have also found some interesting results, some pollen and an OSL date that falls, even though the OSL date is very broad, either way you look at that OSL date, it also fits in the late Neolithic. Whether it's the beginning or the end, it's not precise enough to say. But again, he's finding that sediment at the right kind of date in his cores, uh, where the sediments are piling up in the, in the playas. 
His student, uh, Harun Ikram, found pollen in some of those cores, pollen from cattail and bulrush. And this suggests that there is a, a much marshier kind of environment than what we see now, not just in water, but actually standing water for long enough for that to uh, maintain. Jen Ramsey has identified fig, both fig seed and fig skin. And so you, here you see her scanning electron microscope uh, examples of some fig and seed that were found there. But probably most dramatic and most interesting was the discovery by uh, Britta Lorenzen that we have Quercus ithaborensis, uh, otherwise known as Tabor oak or Mount Tabor oak. Now, as you could see in any of those draw illustrations that you've seen so far, there are no trees out there. And it would be very surprising to see an oak be able to survive out there at this point. The closest stands of oak that we can currently see are a good 200 kilometers away to the west in the highlands of uh, Jordan in places, say, closer to Ajloon, Jerash, or even possibly you would also find some examples of oak in this area, which is a highland area of uh, southern Syria. So even though our, our sample, that piece that uh, Britta Lorenzen of oak that she, she recognized, uh, was just a twig. So this is not proof that there is a forest of oak out there. But it is suggestive, and the distance suggests that people were probably not dragging out oak logs that far away out into the desert uh, for building material to just burn them. Now, our follow analysis, we, we have a lot of animal bone from inside of that structure. Of course, over the of a thousand years, a lot of animal bone has collected, and the preservation was actually better than we originally expected. Uh, only a sample has been studied by Alex Wass, who's doing our, our, our analysis of the animal bones. But so far, he's already recognized that gazelle are what the dominant species. And then wild uh, onager, donkeys, are also well represented in the sample, as well as wild hare. What isn't well represented, there's some examples, but a small part of the faunal assemblage is domesticated goat and sheep. That's quite small. So if these were herders, we don't have very good evidence to demonstrate that. One other thing that he found that was quite surprising was the, some Asiatic lion, the paw of an Asiatic lion, or at least some bones from the paw of an Asiatic lion, as well as some other large cats, something like a cheetah or a leopard. Uh, so that was quite a surprise. Now, in this lecture already, you've seen some arrowheads. In this slide, I'd like to show you some rather different kinds of arrowheads. And of course, I don't expect everybody to be amazed by the arrowheads, but there are a lot of arrowheads which is perhaps not so surprising given the amount of time that that building was used and reused. What's particularly interesting is that, as you see, archaeologists like to represent their arrowheads with the point up, with the business end. And you'll notice all of these, of which 90% of the arrowheads from that structure were this type, this transverse arrowhead. You'd think they're upside down because that's the pointy end. But in fact, this is the sharp end. So they're sharp little razors. The transverse arrowheads are something that's known from across a large region from Egypt well into Syria and is, is thought to have been, uh, some people have argued that it's maybe a hunting component, that there was a series of them. But at any rate, however they were used, they are really prominent at this structure. I would guess that because they're so small, they might have been used for the hare and for the wild fowl that would have been attracted by the, the pools. Uh, the the, the uh, birds have not been studied yet at the site, so we don't know what kind of birds would be there, but it wouldn't be surprising that there, there will be some, uh, some pretty good examples. Just to support the idea that there are shafts being uh, created out of whatever local materials, whether it's some sort of reed or wood, we find these uh, sort of engravers for straightening shafts, we call them shaft straighteners, and so you see that indentation for creating a nice straight shaft for your arrow to go on. Well, generally speaking, an archaeology lecture without some pottery would be uh, missing something. Well, luckily, we get very little pottery, so you will not have to endure it. And many prehistorians get a little, you know, they get a little, uh, a little crabby if they have too much pottery. We're very happy with this pottery because that's about half of the pottery we found, what you see right there. Um, that keeps it at a manageable level. And it's diagnostic pottery, which is all you can ask for, really. This is what's known as Yarmoukian pottery. You can tell both by the red uh, exterior and by the, the herringbone pattern that you see. This is typical of the Yarmoukian pottery, better known from Palestine and Israel. That fits very well with the dates that we have from the site, with the, uh, with the arrowheads. 
Another thing that was really wonderful about the site is that it was clearly, uh, people clearly had time to produce a lot of beads. And so they were using different materials that were coming from some distance, some of them not a great distance, and some of them we don't know where from. So you see the red uh, stone, that's carnelian. We don't actually know where the carnelian is coming from. And as far as I understand, I believe there's a graduate student working on this question right now for his dissertation. Where is the carnelian coming from? We know that, it's, that it exists in the Indus. That seems like an awfully long ways away. Maybe there's some other sources closer. But there are some other materials as well that are not immediately local at the site, something called daba marble, um, that indicates that people have connections or moving across the landscape, which is per perhaps not too surprising. So I highlight this, especially the arrowheads, because this is quite different than what we saw at the other structures. The other structures had arrowheads, but they were pretty big arrowheads. And at this building, we've seen lots of these very small transverse arrowheads, which form 90% of those hundreds of arrowheads we found. It suggests that people were really exploiting the water resources nearby, small game, not just gazelle. Uh, but we will come back to the gazelle, so keep that in mind. So what I'd like to do now is turn, I, I said that we'd talk a little bit about excavation, and that's, that's enough uh, small artifacts, I suspect, for the evening. And now let's turn to survey. Now there's a number of different ways to get a good idea of how things look from uh, above. Now one way is just to bring your good old, um, not very expensive deep sea fishing rod out to the desert and put your camera on it and uh, set it to take off, take shots every few seconds. From that you can do marvelous things, get overhead shots, do your photogrammetry, and do a very accurate representation of a structure. So this is that, stru that Neolithic structure on the side of Maitlands. That's wonderful and a great solution for smaller structures, but if you need to really spread across the desert and do some survey, uh, that's going to be a pretty slow way to do it. So one of the solutions we've been working with is uh, using drones, unpiloted aerial uh, vehicles. Now luckily we're working with somebody who has been flying these things since he was a kid with his dad and builds them himself. So the one that you see me holding, that's as, as close as I'm allowed to get to it. I'm allowed to touch it, that's it. Uh, uh, Chad Hill has been building these and he gets these from model kits. They're, they're basically model airplanes and uh, gets them desert ready. The, uh, so these are, you'll probably notice the drone on the right side, known as a DGI and multi-rotor type of um, uh, drone. Its, uh, its advantage is that it can take off vertically and land vertically. Very handy, but not as efficient with battery power. The advantage of the fixed wing that I'm holding in the picture is that it can fly a lot longer and it can and thus use battery power uh, much more efficiently, which is pretty uh, important when you're out in the middle of the desert. Those batteries are very expensive, they're very heavy, you need to bring a bunch of these uh, LiPo batteries with you and then to repower them with your generator takes many, many hours. Um, so I did want to show you just a little bit of it, and let's see, this is always the technical challenge part, of course, to see. This is, of course, the pilot, uh, Chad Hill, getting ready to uh, take off, and let's see if it will go. Yes. Now, this is uh, actually already old, old stuff, um, old technology, old imagery, and uh, so we're taking off, and we're just going to do a, an abbreviated flight over Wasad pools because we've uh, edited this down. So you'll notice some choppy bits where we've cut out so that you're not sitting here for a 20-minute flight. Um, but it is useful to be able to see the landscape around Wasad pools and to be able to see, um, well, how flat it is, how many structures there are, and how much you can see from above ground and how much better you can see it from up there. Let's see, right there you'll notice a wall heading off, um, kind of looks like a kite wall or some sort of meandering wall headed off to the Ka. We'll see some more of those in a moment when we look at kites. And one of the problems is, is that this, the imagery that you're seeing is just a camera on the front of the plane. The, the camera that's actually taking pictures in order to, put, to stitch it together for your survey map is in the body, the fuselage of the plane pointing straight down, and it's taking an image every couple of seconds. The problem is landing the plane. The takeoff was not so bad. You saw that work, went pretty well. But landing the plane without smashing the camera or even getting a speck of dust in it, because as we all know, it only takes one speck of dust and then the camera thing won't open properly anymore. Um, and so bringing it back down in such a rocky landscape of course, that's an advantage of the multi-rotor that can go straight up and down, but the plane can stay up in the air so much longer. Uh, Chad and I had been debating about how to land it in such a rocky area, and he suggested that we land the plane right here on this nice sandy stretch. Except for that's not as easy as it looks, and he got paranoid, rightly so, I think, and 
did what you do in any plane, right? And circled around for another try. He'd wanted to land it right on the sandy area there. And in the past, um, we'd, uh, we'd had other solutions for getting the plane down safely as well. And so we went back to the old tried and true, use the soft belly of an academic, <laughs> and the plane will be fine because it's nice and soft and th the end. Um, despite all of that um, good imagery that comes out of that, there are sometimes disasters. And of course, the desert is not a place for disasters. That is, I think that is the same plane. Um, it's not that we've only had one plane, I can assure you. So um, that, that was a very sad affair, of course. It was even sadder because we had a backup plane, but that backup plane had been caught up in customs, so we didn't actually have it out in the desert with us. Remarkably enough, I must point out that uh, Chad is not only such a good pilot, he's also good at putting these things to get, together. So we had a brief respite from this particular uh, episode of flying and collecting survey data. Uh, we took all those parts back that we could find, except for the destroyed camera, the destroyed GPS, and other components inside. He found those components in Amman somehow, where you're not allowed to buy drones. And that plane that you see before you flew again. And we took it back out to the desert and finished it. I, how that's possible, it took a lot of glue, some tape, um, uh, hot glue guns, which are not hard to find in Amman, luckily. And that, that flew again. So what is this good for? I mean, it makes for nice video, uh, but it's also very useful for orthorectifying images and being able to put them into GIS and be able to make maps out of photographs. This is an incredibly accurate way to be able to do something that in traditional methods would take so much longer that it's also almost unfathomable. So this is an orthophotograph taken of the, of the pools. And I just wanted to point out that what we're gonna look at next um, is these are gonna be petroglyphs that is rock art, that are gonna be concentrated right along these, I, don't really, I shouldn't call them cliffs, because it's only, say, eight to 10 meters we're talking about, but faces of basalt, where people are pecking animal figures, over 400 of them just in that small area. And so what we're doing is trying to survey them and uh, collect all the data that we can on all of the different petroglyphs in the area. Now, of course, these are not painted. These are pecked right into the basalt. So on the left, you can see something with big, long horns. It was clear that horns were particular obsession because uh, we don't really see any gazelle represented. Lots of things with horns. So on the left you see what looks like maybe an oryx, we're not sure. On the right, what seems to be very clearly an ibex because it's got those nice knobbly uh, curved horns of an ibex. And then it's got some sort of spiraling geometric thing that I believe was there before they put the ibex. And I have no idea what that is. A, a person falling off, I don't know. Um, other, other animals as well. Again, something that looks like, I think my colleague had called it a gazelle, and I changed it because that really does not look like gazelle horns to me, maybe an ibex, with a dog chasing it, and something that looks like a, uh, a nice big bull. So they were very fond of representing animals. There are very few of people. There is one nice uh, episode of a sort of a hunting scene, uh, difficult to make out, I realize, of course. This is the, literally the best we could do is night photography. And uh, so you have one ibex, two ibex, three ibex, and actually two human figures, one there and one there. They're both holding something that could be a spear or an arrow. You can see one there, the other one's pretty difficult to make out. So something like a little hunting scene of hunters going after some ibex. So what was surprising is that they were also representing hunting traps, hunting structures that we will talk about in a minute on these rocks. So these big traps for hunting animals, particularly gazelle, were represented and represented pretty, you know, pretty commonly in the petroglyphs around the pools. You can see all sorts of squiggly lines, but what it is is a large enclosure with the little cells that are always found around the edges of the enclosures of these hunting traps. And I'll show you some more examples in a minute if you aren't familiar with them or don't know what it is. Uh, we'll talk about them. This is one of the better examples, and uh, part of the reason I say that is because it's incredibly hard to make out, but there's actually an animal in the animal trap right there. You can see the legs, the body, and some curly horns. Well, of course, what we're really interested in doing is sort of knowing how many of different types there were, what their connections are to each other, which parts are scenes where animals represented next to traps to try to make some contextual sense out of more than 400 representations in this tight little area. So we're mapping this uh, digitally, mapping out where you can see the, the red are all the different figures, all the different animal figures as well as humans, um, and the blue are those types of traps, the animal traps, the structures. 
So this is clearly, people had a little time on their hands anyway, pecking these into the rocks. Perhaps this is what they were doing while they were waiting for the animals to show up around the pools. Uh, and so in their spare time, doing some nice artwork. Of course, things that were important to them were these animals with large horns. This is a little perplexing. We don't know how to date the petroglyphs. We haven't had, we don't, you know, we don't have an easy way to date such petroglyphs. Painting, you have a shot. The petroglyphs are very difficult. The animals are not represented. You'll notice that I talked about the animals that we found in the, in the uh, uh, faunal assemblage were things like gazelle and onager and hare. And we didn't see any of those in the rock art. We saw things with big horns, ibex. The ibex don't even, aren't even naturally occurring in this area. So this is a bit perplexing, and we don't know what the rock art dates to. It's tempting to say Neolithic, but the Neolithic faunal assemblage doesn't represent these types of animals. Of course, people also still like to represent what they find very important to them in petroglyphs. And uh, modern day people find a, a Mercedes tanker truck one of the most important things that you would need to get the water and food out to your flocks. For larger survey, the, the fixed wing plane is really what is more useful. Uh, we are attempting to do and have flown over a 32 square kilometer area of the, of the mesas at Wadi Katafi. And uh, that took a number of different flights, uh, as you saw, had some accidents and some problems. But it's uh, now all mapped. It's all been uh, something like 22,000 images have been collected. And uh, we're now starting to work on actually over marking all the different structures that we've identified in that 32 square kilometer area, both on top of the mesas and down on the slopes. So here's one of the mesas. You can see the structures that are um, a few on top, but a lot of them clustered around on the lower shoulders. This is the ortho photograph. And then over here, you see a hillshade model so that you can see the structures more clearly. One of the fascinating things that is going on out in the body, out in the desert in general, are the um, kites, these animal traps. And the animal traps are uh, very often found in these long chains. So what you're looking at is a satellite image, and each red triangle represents an animal trap, what is called a kite, because those early aviators thought they looked like the shape of a kite, and ever since we've been calling them kites. A fair amount of research has been done, usually using satellite imagery, to look at the kites, because you can spot them from satellites, unlike the smaller Neolithic structures. So here we have the Wadi Katafi area, and over here with sod pools. Um, I'd like to show you an example of a kite. It actually is going to be one from this chain here. They're incredibly hard to see from the ground, because they're not big walls. So this one is a kite that's got an enclosure. You can, I hope, make that out pretty clearly. You might even be able to tell that it's kind of got a green fuzz. It doesn't look so gray and brown and dead. And that's because we were there in the spring, something I'd never done before. Uh, it was beautiful, actually. There were flowers. There were Bedouin with camels. It was uh, remarkably different than being there in the summer. It was very pleasant. This kite is a large enclosure. And you see these small cells. You, there'd be one there and one there that are buried. You can see some there, there, and there. So this large enclosure. And it's got these long walls extending. They all extend to the east, where the animals were presumably coming towards the cooler climes in the west and probably better watered areas. Now, I wanted to show you just a short clip. I don't think we'll even run through the whole clip of, the, um, of some drone imagery, because this was being used to corral these animals into the enclosure. Is it moving? Yes, it's moving. Um, and you will notice the difference in the drone imagery because this is being done with a, the nice new fixed wing uh, drone. So it gets a nice, very nice, smooth imagery um, as, as it rotates around. Now, what you're looking at, of course, is uh, these long walls. In some kites, they go on for kilometers. And they're being used, we, we assume that there are people, probably dogs, stationed along these walls to scare herds of gazelle towards and, and into this funneling area within and in towards the enclosure of the kite. Now, for a long time, I've assumed, and I assume that I, I believe that many of my colleagues also had the same assumption, that these little cells here in the enclosure, when the animals showed up, the hunters were hidden in there and came out with their bows and their spears and killed the animals inside the enclosure. However, surprisingly enough, colleagues of ours, uh, Wael Abu Aziz and Remy Krasad, have excavated inside of one of those cells of the kite. And what they found is that inside of this cell, it was deeper, it was several meters down, and inside of it was a partially articulated gazelle. And so this suggested that, in fact, the trap is that cell 
and the animals cannot see that it's a deep inclination, a pit, and they fall into the pit. And if, they, if that doesn't kill them, they can then easily be killed by the hunters. Now, that's just one example. I'm not convinced that that's the only way that they work, but it was intriguing, it was surprising to find that out. Um, and so you can see just how many of these would be all around the edge, and, and I'm, not, I'm not really certain that that's the only way it worked, but it's a fascinating discovery that they've come up with. You, you can see as these walls go off, you won't be able to tell that there's other meandering walls that seem to connect these kites in sort of that chain that you saw in the satellite imagery, so that they're really sort of coming all down along a ridge, so the animals are going to be for, forced one way or the other into some sort of uh, trap. This must have taken a huge amount of labor, a huge amount of time, even though those walls aren't very tall. It took a lot of work and organization to set these things up across the desert for kilometers. We do have a problem with dating. We don't know exactly what they date to. We have some that seem to be Neolithic. We have some from southern Israel that seem to be late Calcolithic, early Bronze, just one. Uh, they may have been in use through that entire period. Uh, and so then you, uh, this is, yeah, basically uh, the four of us just standing inside of the kite, and you can see those radiating walls. Hopefully you're not dizzy already. I also just wanted to show you an example of how difficult it is to see these walls. He's standing inside of that enclosure of that kite. You can tell that that's where the wall is, but when you, even using the word wall seems inappropriate because that's, that's a line of rocks, and even if it was a little higher, it wasn't much higher. There's not enough rock around there to be a serious wall. This one's a little bit easier to see. I know that that's the uh, kite wall. Uh, you can see it a little bit better because it's not mixed in with so much rock. But even so, you can see that it's quite low, quite small, low to the ground. Just another example of some of the orthophotographs of the, uh, of the mesas that were taken with some of the drones that we've put together. You can see lots of corrals or animal pins. Some of these might be pretty recent, some of them might be historic. A relatively small mesa that's losing a lot of its basalt that's been torn away and used for these structures. And you can just make out a kite. It's actually maybe a double kite or one that has been repurposed, re refurbished at least once. And so here we highlight some of the walls just so that you can see them better on top of the uh, orthophotograph. And so this is the kind of process we're going through for that entire 32 kilometer uh, square, square kilometer area to uh, map in all of the structures. Now another example of a kite, and what I find interesting, it shouldn't be surprising, but people were very conscious of their landscape, of course, any hunter would be. They were using the landscape to their advantage for building these animal traps, for building these kites. So this one is on top of the largest mesa at Wadi Katafi. It's called uh, Tel A from historic times, or number two, Mesa two. And you can see walls that are coming all the way up the mesa from different directions, leading into the enclosure, and then the small cells all around the edges like we've seen, and then over on the precipice on the edge of the mesa, more cells in the walls. So the animals can either uh, fall down over the edge, fall into, uh, into one of these cells, but they don't have many places to go. They're using the, the edge of the mesa. This is another example, a little bit different, where they're using two mesas, smaller mesas really, so you have a mesa on this side and a mesa on this side, and walls that are channeling the animals in and very steep sides of the mesas, so they will sort of naturally go away from that anyway, and then the walls will make sure that they'll stay inside of that funnel. It's a little hard to see the enclosure, so here's the same one from a different angle from the other side. Now, one of the things that we started to recognize as we started to, to process this data and look at our imagery is the... Um, the way that we discovered a couple more kites in Wadi Katafi. So this is Wadi Katafi from pretty high up, and you can see that we've outlined some of the kites that you've just seen, such as that one that came between two mesas, or the very large one that went up the very large mesa. Um, what we're starting to see, is, or, or we're starting to guess, is that these kites may have actually had connecting walls so that it was a long chain, and that chain was also using the mesas, just like on the long meandering walls of the, the, the long chain that I showed you in the satellite imagery. So that the animals who are coming, you can see they're all open to the east. As the animals come, they're gonna find either a wall or they're gonna run into a mesa and they're gonna have very little chance to go anywhere else but inside of one of these enclosures. Uh, this is something that we still really need to test. One thing that we've talked about is per perhaps using some thermal imagery to be able to see if some of these walls, these dotted lines that we can't actually see, might be able to be just, just discovered just below 
the, the desert sands. So we, we think that we have a similar plan where these people were using the kites and the mesas as a long chain for uh, hunting. We're now looking at something that we really didn't recognize before, and that is that it seems like there is um, more data, an increasing quantity of good data that suggests there's something that we're tempted and probably going to call the Black Desert Neolithic, a hunter-gatherer herder kind of cultural complex that people are using varied economic strategies and they're, they're adapted to the desert or in fact, we're guessing that it was maybe more of a steppic environment. If those animals that we've seen, all the gazelle, and if they're processing plants, all of this is leaning towards suggesting that there was more soil and probably a better watered atmosphere at the time than there is now. Um, so it must have been a bit more inviting than it is now and hence people were willing to invest uh, a lot of effort in the hunting and in the structures that they were living in. This might have been because there was an increasing population. I mean, people were already hunting gazelle before this time, before 7000 BC. Why start building all these big kites at great effort unless you need to actually start producing more, culling more, uh, producing more animal skins, um, and perhaps even more dried, dried uh, uh, flesh, more uh, uh, protein. Th this is going to be a tough thing to prove because they're trying to date all of those different kites. It's going to be, be tough. They probably were being used for a very long time. But, uh, but you know, by the later periods in the, in the Calcolithic, there were almost no people out there. So by about 4000 BC, there seemed to be very few people out in the desert again. One of the questions that we still need to answer, well, there's quite a number of questions we need to answer, actually. One of them is, are they also herding animals out there? Do they also have uh, domesticated sheep and goat? I and mean, we have a little evidence for it. Um, are they taking them out there and then not using them because the hunting is what they're relying on when they're out there and they're just using uh, the milk. So for the, 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 the many well-constructed late Neolithic buildings that we've seen, even though it's really just four that, I've, that we've excavated so far, it suggests that there was a real fluorescence in the late Neolithic of, of people spending a great deal of time in the desert, exploiting it pretty heavily and spending perhaps a better part of the year out there rather than just a few months that we had originally guessed at. Um, these, these communities do seem to disappear soon after that, and so that's another question that we are going to have to work on. You know, was, was that climate? Was it because the gazelles were so fully exploited? Uh, was, it, was it both reasons? There, there's a lot of work that we still need to uh, answer on that question. Um, finally, we're, we're, we still need to finish surveying that area of Wasad Pools. You saw that I had a nice little map just of the core area, but there's a large area there that we really haven't mapped, we haven't surveyed it in, and we need to um, have a better sample perhaps than two buildings at either site to really understand are there any late Neolithic burials out there? Are there cemeteries? Uh, are there other later periods structures? We suspect that there are. Of course, we know that there's a late bronze and an Iron Age burial. Um, it's probably not just one, there's probably some others. Um, so with that, I just want to leave it there. I wanted to emphasize how much uh, we wanted to thank the, the many uh, institutions that have supported us, of course, but also especially the many people who've gone out to this really sort of desolate, uh, um, very hot place and put in so much hard work for us because without them, none of this really would have been possible. And so again, let me emphasize that if anybody knows um, some young people with very strong backs who, who hate the internet and hate taking showers. We are, we are looking for people and you should come and talk to me. And uh, so thank you all very much.